Hello, goede avond allemaal. Welcome everybody um, to this uh, last chaos talk of the season. We are here as usual in Museum Dr. Gislain. And also welcome to the people who are watching at home. Um, the, for those who don't know us, uh, Chaos is an arts organization based in Brussels and we do art projects with artists with or without a psychiatric vulnerability. And one of the things we do is an artist in residency in psychiatry. Um, the talks we host here, um, we organize together with our resident who stays with us or who works with us. And he or she is the curator of the evening and can invite other yeah, artists or psychiatrists or whatever to have a talk around certain themes that he or she uh, researches in the residency. So what else do I need to say? Yeah, for the people who follow online, there is a live chat which you can use to ask questions. And at the end of the talk, we will have a Q&A with the public and we will take those questions uh, on stage and look for answers. So tonight we have uh, Stefan Roy, who is our resident for the moment, and uh, he invited Catherine Longley. So I'm very happy that you are here. And so, yeah, I'm not going to talk too much and quickly give the word to Stefan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Mike, for this opportunity and the Museum Dr. Gislain for this great, amazing experience we are living tonight. As uh, an introduction, for me, it is important to note that today's talk will take a humble approach to the notion of resilience from an artistic point of view. It is not intended to engage in the scientific dialogue on the subject, except by opening the door to contribution from specialists and professionals working in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, and human sciences. So first, um, I would like to maybe see the definition itself of resilience. So for this, I found this great definition from the Dictionary of Psychology from the APA, the American Psychological Association, I would like to read to you. Resilience is a process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. A number of factors contribute to how well adapt to adversities, people adapt to adversities, predominant among them, the way in which individuals view and engage with the world, the availability and quality of social resources, specific coping strategies. Psycho psychological research demonstrates that the resources and skills associated with more positive adaptation can be cultivated and practiced. Also, we'd like to quickly go over the image of the artist. I just quickly found a very simple definition sourced from Wikipedia, just to say that an artist is engaged as an activity related to creating art, practi practicing the art, or demonstrating an art. But here tonight, we're going to focus only on visual arts, and especially visual artists. And I won't be addressing about the wide, interesting universes of the art brut, or art, or also the body art movement. They will deserve a specific talk of its own. For a long time, also, the image of the artist were that now is more famous for being a celebrity or a business person, uh, has always been viewed in the past as a, with this romantic reputation, as someone poor, tortured, living through misery, not from love and fresh water, but from his art and all the various dev deviances that came from it, such as drugs, alcohol, prostitutes, depression, psychosis, and other disorders. History has taught us time and time again that artists who give into their demands often suffer tragic fates. A set of tenacious stereotypes, but not so far removed from past or present realities. But the artist is first and foremost a being who, beyond technique, demonstrates an ability to express the singularity of his own language through his sensitive or intelligible approach to the world at whatever level. So, during that talk, I'm going to go through different parts. And here, first of all, I would like to discuss about the resilience in the history of art. As sensitive and intelligible beings, artists are resilient. 
capable of expressing their torments and traumas. This can sometimes nourish the artist's work. Others, on the other hand, end up devoured by them. Here are a few key examples from well-known artists in the history of art with different approaches to resilience as a source of creation and production, and sometimes even of destruction. I will start with Nikit Sanfal. She first received worldwide attention for her angry, violent assemblage, with, which has been shot by firearms. It's the famous uh, shotgun painting that you can see on the image behind me. This, so Nikit Sanfal was hiding pockets of colorful paints in the, in the composition that she was making. And then by using a shotgun and shooting on the canvas, she was revealing the color that was dripping out of the pocket. So this evolved into Nana's, the most well-known work from the artist. Light-hearted, whimsical, colorful, large-scale sculptures of animals, monsters, and women, especially female figures. Her most compressive work was the Tarot Garden that you can see here. It's a large sculpture garden containing numerous works ranging up to outsized creations. So it's really the biggest work she ever worked on. She also collaborated with worldwide famous artists such as uh, Jasper Jones, Robert Rauschenberg, John Cage. And uh, for several decades, she worked especially closely with Swiss kinetic artist Jean Tengeli, who also became her second husband, and with who they did together that famous Stravinsky Fontaine next to the Centre Pompidou in Paris. But I also would like to point out that she was the only female member, uh, member of the Nouveau Realisme movement in France. But let's focus also on the history of Nigit Sanfal because she has quite an interesting past. She grew up in a strict Catholic environment against which she repeatedly rebelled. Her mother was temperamental and violent, beating the younger children and forcing them to eat and having different uh, violent approach in her education towards the children. Both of her younger siblings, Elizabeth and Richard, would later commit suicide as adults. The atmosphere at home was tense, and she suffered for years of, as she revealed later in her work, uh, she suffered years of sexual abuse from her father starting at the age of 11. She would later refer to the environment where she grew up as hell. More recently, we have the British artist Tracy Amin, who is using her life experiences in her art and her life has become an open book because of it. The most famous work from her is My Bed from 1998. It's a full revelation of her own intimacy by exposing her bed with everything that was related to that bed in her bedroom back then at that time. So Tracy Amin, from her rape at the age of 13 to her long periods of depression, many of her works are controversial and highly, highly confrontational. More um, an older generation, it's Louise Bourgeois. Louise Bourgeois was born on Christmas Day in Paris in 1911. She um, witnessed the war through the parents, I mean, the, the family who went to, to fight the First World War. And she was really quite scared from that whole situation because she was witnessing her mother frantically try to cope and she remember with all the tension and the worry because her uncle died, was killed during the war, and the father, the father was injured. In one of the earliest rem memories she recalls, seeing, and I quote, war trains filled with wounded men with their arms and legs gone. So with Bourgeois, as a young girl, she was extremely close to her mother. Yet she despised the father for his controlling temper and ritual humiliating teasing at family events. When Bourgeois' mother caught a severe case of influenza and was bedridden for, a for months, Louise Bourgeois took care of her while she was witnessing her father having several affairs, including a long-standing one with a living governess. She never fully forgave him, harboring deep-seated rage, jealousy, and a fear of abandonment which would play out in her art as an adult. On grating, Bourgeois opened a print, and, and a print workshop that was just next to her father's tapestry uh, shop. And she met there um, the critic, art critic and historian Robert Goldwater, who came in to buy several Picasso prints. And 
He and Bourgeois immediately hit it off, and she described, in between talks about surrealism and the latest trends, we got married. Together they moved to New York in 1938, just before, before the outbreak of the Second World War. So Bourgeois found leaving everything she knew behind for a new life liberating, yet also deeply unsettling. She wrote, I was in effect a runaway girl. I was a runaway girl who turned out all right. The subject of loss, abandonment, and transition recurred in various motifs through her career, including the early painting she did, Runaway Girl, in 1938, and later in the work, Home for Runaway Girls. This one is from 1994. So calling herself a girl, as even as an adult, was part of her attempt to reject of the shackles and constraint of domesticity. Frida Kahlo's childhood was plagued by a series of unfortunate events. At six years old, she contracted polio and made her left leg shorter and thinner than the other one. Later into her teenage years, she was also involved in a road traffic accident and she recalled the event in vivid detail. She said, the angel pierced me as a sword pierces the bull. The accident, which resulted in several, several serious injuries, meant she suffered from recurring pain for the remainder of her life. It was at this stage that Kahlo abandoned her dream of becoming a doctor and began, began to follow that artist, artist pursuit. At first, she painted simply to occupy herself during the long recovery. Her mother even fashioned for her a special easel so she could paint uh, from the bed. So this blossomed into a passion that will establish her as one of the most influential artists and public figure, figure in history. Carlos' emotionally intense marriage to Diego Rivera led her to develop depression and even attempt suicide. But she was very strong-minded even though experts believe that Frida Kahlo suffered from more than one mental health problem, such as post-traumatic stress disorder and bipolar disorder. So Kahlo produced only 20, uh, 200 paintings, mostly self-portraits. And she said, I will paint myself because I am so often alone, because I'm the subject I know best. The Norwegian artist, Edvard Munch, was born in the year 1863 and died in 1944. His childhood was shaped by loss, health problems, and overly strict and religious father. This helped Munch develop anxious thoughts and an intense fear of death and hell. Munch is known for incorporating his emotions and psychological states into his paintings. The depiction of mental states is apparent in many of Edouard Munch's artworks, such as Melancholy in 1892 and also Despair from the same year that you will see just after. Both paintings show an isolated man seemingly buried in thoughts while looking down. The paintings were created following the death of Munch's father. Due to the death of his father, the artist's emotional state became worse. Despite the fact that Munch suffered from depression, anxiety, and probably schizophrenia, he refused treatment for some time. He stated, my suffering are part of myself and my art. They are indistingu indistinguishable from me, and their destruction will destroy my art. I want to keep the sufferings. Munch was committed to sanatoriums several times in the years from 1905 to 1909, and after he stays all at these institutions, his mental health improved significantly. Because of this, Munch's art changed. His paintings started to look brighter, less gloomy, since he felt better and mentally more stable. Recent studies have shown that Vincent van Gogh may have suffered from bipolar disorder, and his artwork, although colorful, often reflects his emotional pain. Despite wanting to be a pastor, van Gogh's life was deeply affected by mental illness, and he went through several torrid love affairs and bouts of depression. He often coped with this through his art, and he drew the people and places that influenced his life. Here, for example, you have um, a view that he painted from the corridor of, in the Islam, in where he was staying back then at the time. In later life, he found it difficult to write letters, and he, found he went through stages of not being able to work, along with stages of being extremely inspired and working prolifically. After shooting himself, his last words were reported to be, the sadness will last forever. 
Michel Basquiat used art as an escape from his chaotic personal life. Although he was an intelligent child, he had a mentally ill mother and has been in and out in station for years. He was homeless as only 15 years old and he began expressing himself with graffiti around New York before concentrating on different artistic styles such as human anatomy. He attempted uh, drug rehabilitation and sobriety, along with exploring different themes in his artwork to cope with his difficult past. His work often looked at racial oppression and slavery. Sadly, he died at age 27. And last, uh, no, not last, once more after that, Marina Abramovic, isolated from other children and condemned to forced uh, aloneness, she began drawing daily. It was one of the only activities that she was allowed to do back then as a child. Drawing became a lens through which she saw and understood the world. Beaten up until being in her 20s, she became famous through her performances. First with her life partner, Ulai, and then on her own, freeing herself from that relationship which became toxic. She brings the journey full circle to the determinative experiences of her childhood, attesting to the fact that great artists spend a lifetime making power from their wounds. And the last one, Yayo Kusama, born in 1929, is a Japanese artist who work, works primarily in sculpture and installation. She is one of the most important living artists to come out of Japan, the world's top-selling female artist and the world's most successful living artist. Kusama has been open about her mental health and has resided since the 70s in a mental health facility which leaves daily to walk to a nearby studio to work. She says that art has become a way to express her mental problems. And as she said, I fight pain, anxiety, and fear every day. And the only method I have found that relieve my illness is to keep creating art. I followed the trade of art and somehow discovered a path that will allow me to live. So it's quite interesting um, stories. And of course, any art historian could pick 100 more examples in that particular topic of resilience and creativity. But here I would like to not only focus on this part, I also would like to focus on artists who engage with communities. Artists do not necessarily carry within, within them the pain of the world. Sometimes they become each other's medium, drawing inspiration or engaging directly with vulnerable people or communities. These interactions culminate in work, sometimes even collective artworks that contain all the hallmarks of the resilience of our human spaces. And first, I would like to discuss about the Belgian artist Francis Alice. Born in 1959 in Antwerp, uh, his work emerges in the interdisciplinary space of art, architecture, and social practice. In 86, Alice left behind his profession as an architect and relocated to Mexico City, where he lives and works. He has created a diverse body of artwork and performance art that explores urban tension and geopolitics. His works examine the tension between politics and poetics, individual action and importance. The particular is the nature of the game. In the course of its extensive travels around the world since 1999, Alice's camera captured children playing in public spaces, like eating or sleeping. Playing is an essential human need, and children's games are universal. These informal ethnographic films record both the power of cultural tradition and the carefree attitude of children, even in situations of serious conflicts, like children playing in the middle of a war, for instance. The Nature of the Game is a title that uh, Francis Alice's exhibition was for the, Bie the Belgian Pavilion in the 2022 Venice Biennale. It will be shown next September at the Wills in Brussels. Ai Weiwei, um, after denouncing government corruption and lack of respect for human rights, and freedom of speech in China, was arrested, beaten, and placed in uh, isolation and forbidden to travel. His activity as a dissident has gone hand in hand with his artistic career, and he has continued to produce work testifying to his political beliefs, while at the same time making plenty of room for creativity and experimentation. His output over the past 30 years allows us to explore his ambivalent rapport between the Western culture with the culture of his own country. 
drawn between a deep-rooted sense of belonging and an equally strong urge to rebel. In 2015, Ai Weiwei was awarded the Ambassador of Conscious Award by Amnesty International for his actions in support of the defense of the human rights. Human Flow, in, that was um, released in 2017, is epic film journey took part in the 74 Venice International Film Festival. This film gives a, a powerful visual expression to the contemporary massive human immigration. Captured over the course of an eventful year in 23 countries, Human Flow follows a chain of urgent human stories that stretches across the globe. Born in 1983, Gier is an artist who exhibits freely in the streets, communities, and public spaces of the world, catching the attention of people who are not typical museum visitors. His work mixes art and action. He tackles themes such as commitment, freedom, community, and identity. In 2006, he launched Portraits of a Generation. It was a huge format portrait that he took from this kind of uh, suburban thugs from Paris, and he placed it in the rich districts uh, of the walls of the bourgeois districts of Paris. The year later, in 2007, he, with his partner, he created Face to Face, which some consider the biggest illegal photo exhibition ever that Jay posted huge portraits of Israelis and Palestinians face to face in eight Palestinian and Israeli cities on both sides also of the security fence, the separation barrier between Israel and Palestine. And then he embarked on a long international travel trip in 2008 for this project, Women Are Heroes, underlining the dignity of women who are the target of conflict. Now I would like to also focus about our guest of tonight. And first, about Céline Cuvillet that unfortunately could not be present with us tonight, but she sent me some documentation I will share with you, and also some, um, some of her own voice that I will put for her tonight. So Céline Cuvillet is a multi-faced artist whose work combines painting, sculpture, installation, and photography. Through her artistic research, she was naturally drawn to working with people who experience the limits of our societies. And here we are going to focus on three examples. First, since 2016, she's been working with women prisoners through weekly art workshops. When you arrive in prison, she says, you have different choices. You let yourself go through drugs, uh, vegetative states, sleeping all day long, letting yourself die. Second, you try to prolong the life you had before by setting up networks, power groups, etc. Or third, you reinvent yourself, you rebuild yourself differently, showing resilience. Most of the inmates that I meet at the workshop tend to fall into the third category, perhaps because most of them are women serving long sentences. So it's a case of resilience or death. It's also because they often already gone through a phase of letting go during their first incarceration. There comes a time when you've had enough dwelling on your guilt, your crime, and you have to try to move on, to rebuild yourself in a different way. Sometimes this seems to be a matter of survival instinct. If you don't want to die, or wither away, you have to move on. So, Céline, through a workshop, built a space, a place for sharing, experimenting, and regaining self-confidence. It's a place where one can be different in a caring community. And it's also, for the artist herself, a source of inspiration for her own practice and the work that she's producing afterwards. All these different elements bear witness to the impressive human capacity to adapt and face adversity, whatever the individual backgrounds. And here I will quote her again. She says, I found that really inspiring. There is some, something universal about it that I think it is worth emphasizing. And that's what I try to do through my artistic work. Whatever our national background, no one escapes the possibility of going off the rails one day. And once that happens, in order to not remain in the gutter, an instinct pushes us to get our hands dirty and to fight, to keep moving forward. Since 2015, she's been working in refugee camps in Calais, Beirut, southern Lebanon, um, and in Brussels as well. There she met people who have left behind 
uh, everything, who have abandoned their families, their homes, social status and traditions, and who find themselves with nothing, having to rebuild everything from scratch. So she says, they find themselves de facto associated with a group, migrants, made up of individuals who are just as different from each other. The same goes for prison inmates, the disappearance of individuation. Resilience process are all the more present in immigrant, in migrant populations, firstly because their living conditions on the roads and in the host countries are terrible, but also and above all because they have to mourn, mourning for the life they have had before the war forced them to flee. And for all the refugees mourning the projection expectations and dreams of a better life, here again, it's the gaps between projection and expectations prior to migration and the actual experience that I'm interested in sharing in my visual work. But it's also about adaptability and resilience of individuals in this unimaginably precarious situation. In particular, in prison, um, the logic of do or die resurfaces. It's also the same for the ability of children in migrant situations to adapt, show resilience or stay at the side of the road. Our societies don't allow any other way out. As well as those who have died along the way, we sometimes see in our cities the ghost of those who have made the journey, those for whom resilience has not worked, who have been caught up in drugs or alcohol, for whom social integration has not worked. Is resilience a tool for social integration? a weapon, a necessary path to avoid ending up in the gutter. Once again, in my opinion, there is social injection, injection to show resilience, show resilience or die. And the final work that she's been conducting since the end of 2021, she's also been running art workshops with women suffering from severe depression. Here again, the question of resilience is central. Medication is used to compensate for the lack of resilience. But it is often applied very quickly, leaving no time for the resilience process to take hold. Once medicated with painkillers, anxiolytics, and antidepressants, individuals often lose their energy of lucidity. They need to rebuild and adapt to adversity. She says, this is what I'm interested in exploring in my artistic practice. The systematic tendency to medicate people suffering from mental illness, the lack of space left in our societies, for isolation and collapse. So through her workshop, she develops work with the people she's engaging with, but at the same time, she, after finishing, continues to work by own, um, with all the elements that she gathered together to produce new content and series that are highly engaged as a, as a portrait of our societies of today. As a conclusion, she wanted to say that if I had to say one more thing, I would say that in the end, I'm not totally in favor of the principle of resilience as a virtue because it suits our productivist societies too well. In fact, I found that in the 21st century in the West, resilience is extolled as an absolute strength and asset, but that's only because it suits everyone. We can bear to see the failure of our systems reflected in the psychological collapse of our own people we would rather encourage them to get over the shit that our societies produce than let them suffer publicly. It's move on, get over it, or we will push you aside and give you the tools so you can kick the shit out of yourself and disappear into the limbo of oblivion. Thank you, Celine. And now I would like to leave the floor for Catherine Long. Well, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, works I've been doing recently. Um, but first, um, let me tell you a little bit about my motivation to engage into a work. Um, it's really start with a true curiosity for the world. It's uh, uh, Starting an artwork is kind of an excuse for me to discover a world I'm not familiar with and to engage with communities I'm not familiar with. Uh, to people I would not um, meet uh, in my everyday life. So um, I'm curious about something, about a social phenomenon, and then I try to engage with this community. And this, yeah, this is actually uh, how I am, how I'm working. And it often starts with a sociolo sociological question. For example, I've been working on a eating a contest because my question was, how is it possible to uh, 
eat like one kilogram of stinky cheese in 15 minutes. There should be a logic. I really truly believe that human, human beings are logical, they have their own logic and uh, through my artwork I try to um, find out what are those logic I'm not familiar with. And I found out why uh, <laughs> eating a one kilogram of cheese can be logical, but let's talk about it later. And um, yeah, um, it takes some time to realize what uh, your work is about, what links all of your work together. But to me, uh, it appears clearly now that it's the relationship. It's uh, my main material, and it's also what drives me as a human being to uh, engage in those relationships. And yeah, this artwork, as I said, is an excuse to engage. Um, about my methodology, um, it takes a while to to settle, but now I can say that um, it yeah I have kind of a pattern. I start with uh, researching a lot. Well, I forgot to use the <laughs> the, the three books have been published so far. And yes, my methodology <laughs> first researching. So I order a lot of books, all the books that. Um, about a subject I'm interested in. I read a lot on the internet, but not only uh, uh, sociological website, but also on uh, uh, tabloids and uh, many kind of sources. And then when I feel ready after doing that kind of work, uh, this was about ikikomori, a phenomenon, perhaps I will have time to talk about it later. Um, I engage, I try to get in touch with the communities. Um, sometimes through associations, sometimes online, sometimes uh, attending some events like eating contests or anything. And then I go and try to connect with those people and um, interview them for long interviews. This is yeah, the first thing I'm, I'm doing without taking a picture. Uh, I'm a visual artist and photographer, but not necessarily. I can also use different kind of... Um, of of uh, of medium, it de really depends on what um what story I want to tell, and this is a very uh, critical part because you have to uh, introduce yourself um, in a way, and I, I my yeah uh, I I would never lie uh, to people uh, like saying oh I'm just an eating contester or anything I'm just saying I'm an artist, but it doesn't mean that I cannot be engaged with those communities and also share things with them. But I think it's important to um, stay, to, to s tell them from the first moment, I am an artist and let's see what we can do together. So this the next, um, this is the interview part. So I meet a lot of people. I try to understand uh, from, the, from the inside. And most of the time this, doesn't work anymore because you knowing a subject from around it's not the same as yeah from from the inside so most of the time the intuitions uh, should be modified and then I'm researching visual material so sometimes I take pictures sometimes I ask people to take pictures sometimes I ask people to look through their archives or sometimes uh, like find newspapers it can be anything that is um, meaningful for telling the story I want to tell and one uh, thing that is really important to me is engaging to co-creation. So I ask the people to take pictures of themselves, to give me their archives, uh, to introduce me to some other people. And so I try to develop this more and more. It's not my work, but it's a collaborative work. I'm, I'm kind of leading and I'm, I create the setting that can make the, um, the, the artwork emerge, but not necessarily do pictures or do everything myself. Um, I see myself more like a sculptor or um, a collector or conductor uh, because uh, I have this material I've been collecting and then I try to, uh, like a sculpture with in, in front of a big block of stone, trying to put this into a shape. And this is really what I'm doing with all this material, interviews, pictures, archive. I try to build up a narration out of that without excluding the protagonist from the editing part. That is very important. And I, of course, keep contact after the work. So I think when I will be old, my only, uh, yeah, I will all my time getting in touch with uh, people from the previous project. I won't have time to make new projects anymore.
So the first work I want to talk about tonight is uh, called To Tell My Real Intentions, I Want to Eat Only A's Like a Hermit. This is not me inventing that title. It's one of the per person I worked with, but I think it's very poetic according to the, the subject. Uh, it existed as a book and as an exhibition. This was the cover of the book and this is the, the exhibition. And it starts from a very personal angle. I used to be overweight when I was a child and I wanted to confront that to other people's uh, stories. So I've been to Japan and asked 10 people about their relationship with food and uh, with their bodies. I went to Japan because there's a lot of things to say about food. They're crazy about food, but also there's a lot of pressure on bodies. So and. It's very interesting, and also it was very far from my own uh, culture, so it allows me to make a step forward and go go back and forth and understand my story a bit better. Um, so I asked those people, I interviewed them for a long time, and then I asked them to make pictures themselves uh, about their relationship with food and their bodies, and asking them to make pictures allowed them to say things they couldn't say um, through uh, words during the interview. Um, and then I added myself only some elements of context, some archives or drawings or collages, uh, press clips, um, to uh, understand the context of the stories a little bit better. But um, the, the focus is on the, the, the people's interviews. Um, it's a very dangerous process <laughs> because you never know what you're going to get. I ask people, make 10 pictures with this disposable camera. So you never know if the picture will be totally dark or perhaps all the same from one person to, an, uh, to another and it's gonna be a very boring work, a boring book. But actually I'm really happy uh, I trust those people because every one of them uh, made a, a very different approach of the subject. One of them photographed their daily uh, routine about food, but the other one photographed a place where trauma with food happened. And all of them, they found really different ways to tell the story, actually. So I was really happy I could uh, trust them on this. I, I didn't say I was not afraid, but I did it, and it was yeah, quite successful. Um, just a few examples. Uh, this is a story about uh, anorexia. So those people had or hadn't uh, eating disorders. Some had and some some didn't. So it's it's a mix. It's just people talking about their relationship with food. And I think there's no uh, clear uh, wall between uh, having eating disorders or not having eating disorders. It's more fluid than that. Um, and so she was, uh, she still still is anorexic. So the, um, the setting on the wall should be a bit void because all of the pictures he sent me, uh, they were void of any calorie. So I also had to find the way to present uh, the pictures in uh, to respect the, 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 the atmosphere. And this one on the opposite is totally obsessed by sweets. So I had to find a totally different setting for him. So you have images from the book and from the exhibition, so you can see the description. Right, totally different approach. And she focuses on her body, actually. She, uh, she's totally good looking and, and very healthy person, but she focuses on all the um, little details uh, and the little uh, things that she doesn't like in her body. And she uh, fo really focuses on that on every picture. That was very touching and as you can see, very different from the other pictures. The main challenge for me was to put everything together in a very coherent whole, because it's very different material for every story. But yeah, trying to find a, something that make everything stick together was quite a challenge, but also really what I love about my work. Proceeding this way, you can have also very good surprises. Uh, as a photographer, you know, you are used to the way you take pictures, but it's sometimes nice to um, look through other how other people see photography, and it really um, challenged me uh, to see how those, pic those people 
used photography. For example, this person, she put some uh, uh, grease on the, the lens of the camera to have these uh, impressions of, of light. And this was so beautiful with a story. So also a story about uh, suicide and anorexia, but it, it ended up well. But the, the, the images were so poetic. I only met those people once or twice for one, or yeah, two or three hours. So how can we go so deep into uh, their intimacy um, in such a short period of time? I think it's because I decided to involve myself a lot, um, saying my f my story first with uh, being an overweight child. And this is why people could feel uh, comfortable with telling me their story. It was not an artist taking a story um, to make an artwork. It was also um, something happening with between two human beings. Yeah, so this is the second work I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's called Ernie and Plume. Ernia and Feather. And uh, it's the story of those people I met by chains one night before Christmas in a campsite. Um, they invited me in, in their cabin, a very small cabin, wooden cabin, and offered me a beer. And it all started like this. They start joking and telling me a little bit about their life. Uh, we quickly became friends, and I visited them quite often, and it, last, it still lasts now. Uh, it's been like 10 years. Um, and step by step, I discovered more and more about their, their life story, and I decided that... This story is worth a book and an artwork because it's, uh, it's fascinating and also very funny. Um, yeah. It's divided into chapters, even if it's not that clear in the book, but there's a, it's more like sequences. The first sequence is mm, tr getting to know them, so the, the cabin. You know, as a photographer, I was uh, fascinated by this, yeah, this this interior full of object is messy, but it's also every object has a, um, a history. Belgian gastronomy, <laughs> and sometimes they also showed me a couple of old pictures, archives. So this is the some views of the exhibition, and then you have another sequence: is the the life with their friends. It was like this every every time I uh, I went there. They are joking all the time, uh, drinking a bit of alcohol, uh, laughing a lot with a lot of friends around. The table is just so huge in this very small cabin, but they need a big table to welcome all those people in the uh, in the cabin. Very funny, as you can see, and sometimes. They told me, oh, yesterday, you missed such an amazing evening. Oh, you were not there to photograph, blah, blah, blah. We danced on the table, blah, blah. Say, OK, so let's take picture yourselves. And I gave them black and white disposable cameras again. And what this is what they did. <laughs> in the book, we decided to put them like not upside down, but uh, in the other side, uh, because it's a, ch a real change of perspective. In the exhibition, it's printed on uh, like yellowish paper. I didn't put the paper into beer because it could be a bit stinky. It was the, the idea of uh, the night, uh, like nicotine and uh, alcohol a bit. And in the, s the book and in the exhibition, you can see some um, press clips or pictures happening, and you don't know the link with uh, their story and those articles. And it's, um, it's on purpose that I don't reveal that from the first pages or for, for the f first part of the exhibition. You have to question yourself about those uh, criminal facts evoked. What is the connection? You can imagine like them being some kind of Bonnie and Clyde I don't know. And it comes o over and over again in the book. Then you enter another chapter, is when the friends have left and when the illness is coming into their life. So you don't see m many friends anymore on the pictures, 
uh, but still a lot of humor. It's, it's a skeleton, but it, they, they wrote Bleak, the name of the guy, on the skeleton. And yeah, put them some uh, uh, um, walking sticks around. It's, it's always very funny, even in illness. And the friends are gone, but the tenderness between them is, is growing um, at the end of the book. And the last uh, chapter, that was not planned, but actually Bleak uh, passed away uh, in the process. Uh, we were working on the book. Uh, we decided to stop taking pictures, and it was uh, ready for the book, but he passed away at that time. Um, so we had to add this into the book. It was not easy. Um, but at that moment, Nicole, uh, uh, his wife, uh, decided to involve us quite a lot into the book. She gave me old love letters they wrote to each other, and she really uh, became a, a very big part of uh, the edit editing process. And uh, yeah, the last picture is Nicole being alone. So in, th in this book, you have uh, different layers. You have their love story. You have documenting, me documenting their life uh, during eight years, then giving hints about their previous life, saying not saying much but giving some hints and some you have to um, follow the um, inquiry yourself and try to discover yourself there's a couple of uh, dialogues or sms and you can guess about their previous life and also our relationship is visible in the images because i've been going there for 10 years so you, you can see some postcard i send them uh, or some pictures i offer them over the years and there's also another, more uh, universal layers about uh, general reflections about aging, precarity, and it's mainly a book about stereotypes because at the end of the book, you realize that the, all the press clips, they are connected to their story because Bleak was a former policeman and all the criminal facts, uh, it's about what he, uh, he um, the facts he, he was um, sent to the events he was sent to because he was a policeman. So you can imagine Bonnie and Clyde and like a lot of, uh, expect, uh, well, you can imagine a lot, but actually it's perhaps the opposite of what you were thinking about. So that's mostly a book about stereotypes. It's perhaps a bit long. I'm almost finished. Uh, what was, uh, to, to conclude with this, it. Um, what was um, very difficult about this work is to uh, reveal other people's intimacy. It's not mine, it's their love story. It's very intimate. So it's, it was a challenge to find a, the good balance uh, and what to reveal, what to hide because it's too, uh, too intimate. And we did this work together and I was really, really satisfying. Uh, it was the best gift actually ever uh, when Nicole told me, okay, I'm really happy you made this book because now our love story doesn't only exist in my head, but it's also on paper now. So this is, this means that she found uh, utility for the book, uh, which is different from mine, but it's as important. So that was the best gift she could make. And the last images, um, you know, it's very difficult to imagine herself, imagine Nicole in the, in the cabin, while we are having an uh, opening and drinking beer, blah, 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 with a lot of people. She, she doesn't want to uh, go out of her cabin anymore. So I wanted to create a um, connection uh, between Nicole and the visitors, if even just symbolic, so we, they could leave uh, messages for Nicole. And I had hundreds of them, very, uh, very touching. And so now Nicole is still reading them now, one by one. Voilà. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, the last part, I would like to also talk about my own work as an artist, and especially a particular project, a particular experience that I went through that is called the 10 Weeks uh, series. And it started like this, because it's not only about the work itself, but more about how it came to, to this. Following a, a restructuring, restructuring project at a previous workplace, I suddenly learned of my dismissal without any solid reason. 
and I wasn't the only one. Most of the workers were badly treated and uh, ending up being fired or just quitting that toxic place directed by a tyrannic person. And that shitty boss, when he fired me, told me with a smile that I still owed him 10 weeks notice. So I still had to work 10 weeks for him while I knew that I was fired. So the thing is that I was struggling for years to stabilize my situation, trying to find a, a balance, I mean a stable job. And especially with the hope to finally dedicate my free time for my own art projects. And this brutal, unjustified decision came to the day, I mean the day after that I returned from my honeymoon, so completely broke. Sometimes this can be enough to, to break bad or to fall into a deep depression also. But my personal story has been a, a long and hard, chaotic road trip since early age. And I've been exposed to a variety of traumatic uh, experiences causing physical, mental, and psychological suffering. In the end, I was placed by a judge to grow up in a child protection system. In these violent institutions, all cases are mixed together and sometimes exposed to harmful and malicious adults. Some of the kids that I grew up with or some of the kids from this kind of institution end up either locked up or dead um, or even sometimes radicalized and com commit atrocities such as the Paris attacks. Personally, I got lucky meeting the right people at the right time and to focus on my own survival through education. Since then, integration has been a never-ending story of a, uh, a never-ending challenge for me. So when I got fired like shit, realizing that I would be once again being looking for a job for the next months, which means no priority for my personal art projects, I made a decision to leave Bounds. And I decided, to, I decided to, to turn this delicate experience into an opportunity for research, reflection, and artistic reaction. So this is how I thought, because I never had an art residency in my own life, and I was dreaming to one day just being you know, on, a, on a bubble, really, as a resident, to be able to really focus on my own projects. And I thought, okay, now I have a timeline in which I know I'm stuck for 10 weeks and I have to give that notice for 10 weeks, so maybe I can use the time and actually just make it my own residency. So I created the 10 weeks unemployment residency program. So I made up my own residency during that time. So basically it consists on this. During the 10 weeks notice, I question about the situation we go through as a, as a human being, as a citizen, as an artist, as a worker in this modern society, and more specifically in the relation to work. So for each working day, so during my 10 weeks notice, I will produce spontaneously one artwork for every working day, which means in total 50 artwork. But on paper, I'm more like 250 projects in the end. So this spontaneous project is an extension of my own art practice, uh, which focuses around human complexity, whether in community, in its relationship to otherness, or to oneself. I really like to um, try to focus on the human being as a complex being and yeah, you know, like trying to carry and scratch under the surface to go through the, all the behavior, the, the identity and observe the reactions of people in different kind of situation through installations or participative work or different projects that I develop. So during 10 weeks, each new day drew the progressive construction of a large body of projects gathering all type of mediums. I work with photography, video performance, painting, installation, sculpture, uh, participative works, embroidery, and also net art. So this whole approach addresses many themes and issues related to our relationship to the world of labor, from our own identity and behavior relationship to our relationship with others and with the society we are part of. So this project was not a personal directed vendetta about a shitty person. It was meant as a universal topic because we all go through different kind of experiences with work and I thought okay let's make it a really a global and complex study try to really focus on a wider picture and really try to embrace the, the world and its complexity and richness about this topic so but also being fully connected to the tools and context of our time so at the moment I'm currently working on an extended curatorial version of this project bringing together many other artists related to this universal subject. So here are some examples of the 
10 weeks results. So as I said, because the, the pressure was also the timeline, because I was, you know, I knew I was going to be fired, so I had to produce as much as possible, as fast as possible. So it started out with this uh, diptych, hire me, fire me, sometimes with great help, like my guest of tonight, Catherine, who helped me to push the button of the camera. And for me, it was about, you know, starting about my own point of view to try to explore the deep feeling, how you feel uh, in this kind of work relationship, especially when the relationship itself becomes toxic and the view on yourself and the own self-image of yourself when you are stuck in this kind of toxic pattern. But then after I started to go deeper, so here we are 30 days later and I made that installation. Um, it's uh, at the Wheels Project Room and it's called the World of Motivations or the Modern Madness of Integration. So it's a bit difficult to, to realize, but the wall that you see, it's 15 meters uh, long and six meters high. So it's quite impressive when you are in front of it because you have this uh, wall covered with A4 papers. And what I did, I printed out every single cover letters that I wrote between 2012 and 2017. It's 300 in total. And it's not fake, it's real job application that I really sent to real job offers, which is crazy. It's a ridiculous amount of candidate, uh, candidature. So what you see, especially when you're in front of it, and that's the most important part of that installation, it just copy paste. It's every single type, just copy paste letter. You just change the job title, you change the name of the employee, and that's it. And you see even an evolution that last third part of that installation, even the signature is not even human signature anymore, it's just a, a digital signature. So even this becomes copy and paste. So it starts to just acting like a machine, but also losing faith, losing hope, and just you know being in a very automatic process of just, you produce in order to get your shit done and to get a job. Since I was living also in a red light district in Brussels, I thought, okay, let's try something else. So I went and I placed myself in a window of a prostitute and I covered myself with my curriculum vitae, selling my services. So it had really all kind of work with serious things, with some more um, provocative, some with more humility, some are more like with deep layers of uh, interpretations, but also try to experiment things differently. Like for example, I used the social network Tinder for the first time of my life. I made up an account for that particular reason for the 10 weeks project. And I uh, met that profile saying, looking for job opportunities, swipe right if you want to hire me, tell me in details what I can do for you. You might end up one day in a book or in a contemporary art exhibition. So basically the goal was that I just try to match as many people as possible in order to get a reach of 100 match. As you can see in the title, Tinder me, one, quench, one question, 100 answers. This was the goal. Every single time I had a match, I was acting again like a robot. I was always sending exactly the same text. No matter of the person answers or try to interact with me, I was always being, yeah, called like a robot and trying to just stick to my protocol. It was always working with disciplinarity and like really using protocols to direct the production process. And here, basically, I was always asking that particular question. If you would hire me, if you, I could change and make your life better, what you would hire me for? What I could do to change your life, to help you in your life? So at first, because I never used Tinder, so I had no experience with that, I expected that it would be mostly just you know sexual uh, proposals and jokes and stuff like this. But it turned out to be actually really a great experience with um, depicting some yeah, some kind of a portrait of our society at the moment with the younger generations, I mean, young adults, and expressing, yeah, what are their actual needs at the moment? And mostly, it came out from the hundred answers that it's especially people who need personal assistance in their daily life. Personal assistance to deal with the administrative work, with the household, uh, doing the laundry, the groceries, uh, cooking, all this kind of stuff to have someone to help you to go through your life on a daily basis. This was the most uh, recurrent answer. Of course, some wanted to just not be alone at the end of the day, to have a confidence, someone to talk with, someone to help them through therapy, through discussions. 
pour s'occuper du massage, and of course, I had also plenty of pressure for the work. Then I did that other work, um, a series that I would like to continue, actually, because I only tried it once. It was an experiment that I wanted to do, a white room, two chairs. I sent an open call on Facebook saying that I'm looking for people, for volunteers, uh, who have to bring an object of the personal choice, but something that is meaningful to them. We attend that in the end, what I'm expecting from the people, it's you have to engage a discussion with the object itself, and then to the point that you have to let yourself, uh, let a, cr uh, yeah, a scream come out of yourself. You, it's kind of scream therapy. You have to really let it out at the point. You decide when, it can be as long as possible, but just this is a final destination of that particular moment. So the person is facing a camera. I just, I push the button and I leave the room. So the person is really alone, all alone during that process. And then after I come back in the room and I film the person while doing a conversation, asking about to have a, a f an immediate feedback about the emotional impact and the experience that person went through. It was a really um, impressive uh, experience that, yeah, I for sure would like to continue this work. And then another series I'd like to continue that will bring me about the residency I'm conducting at the moment, thanks to Mike and Chaos Casetri. Um, and I encourage people to actually look about this great uh, organization because it's actually an amazing experience I'm going through. Quite, uh, I'm living at the moment 24-7 um, in this uh, psychiatric facility and being totally disconnected from the world. I removed WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram from my phone just only to, you know, produce research and being especially around the adult patients suffering from uh, psychosis who are in the in this place and the people who are working also in this place. And here, I talk about this because this theory, floating in colored smoke, it started like this. I wanted to, I was picturing this image of someone in elevation, in state of elevation, which the face turns out to be this kind of smoke of color. And what I would like to do is actually not do only this. I don't want to have only a picture. I want to actually have a picture that is in a meaningful place for a meaningful, a meaningful person that is posing for the picture, but also to bring out the text. So what I want to do, it's actually, because that's what I'm doing at the moment with the residency, I try to collect narrativities, experiences, and stories, and especially stories about resilience. So that is uh, why also I'm so interested about that topic at the moment in my research. I want to collect this kind of stories of resilience, which people who overcame a difficulty, went through a challenge and went really above it and and get inspired from it in order to actually try to make a picture of this person in that particular place related to that experience and then make that person write a part of that story on the paper and bring the paper and that letter with the picture as a result. So this will call the elevation story. So this particular situation, about 10 weeks, brought me several things. First, it gave me the push that I need to go back to my own art practice. Second, it opened me the doors of cultural and art institutions, that, such as museums and art centers. And also at the end of my 10 weeks notice, I signed, I signed only two weeks after the end of 10 weeks my contract for my next job, which was much greater actually in the end. So as a conclusion, um, first I would like to, because I often face young artists um, and who are questioning a lot about what will um, and how to deal with their starting careers. And after doing many research about different articles and different uh, point of views, I would like to point out different challenges that artists will have to face uh, linked to the resilience uh, process that they might have to go through. As the artistic challenges, they will be working in isolation, few opportunities and short-lived careers. As a physical challenges, the unhealthy lifestyles, of course, the violation of physical boundaries, which leads to exhaustion and physical strain, the injury, and also the long working hours. And as the psychological challenges, the artistic vulnerability, the competition, anxiety, and anxious, constant pressure, the mental health, 
the violation of psychological boundaries and the perfectionism of fear of failure. Art is both sensitive and intelligible. Through works of art, it is possible to transcend all boundaries, language, um, cultures, generations. That is what is fantastic about an artwork. We can actually, with someone I don't speak the same language or I don't share the same culture, I'm able to create a bridge of communication. Art creates bridges that connect people across time and space. At an individual level, resilience enables us to create the distance that space that is necessary to interact with the situation, past or present. We put that situation in distance to take consideration about the context and to be able to work it out. And in this space filled with potential, human beings can grow or develop what will be the best way to, ex to express themselves in the world or to themselves. Or they will rebound in order to find back their lost equilibrium. But while resilience can be a fuel or even the driving force that enables us to move forward, it is prudent to point out the harm that it can do to the human development. Resilience can, for example, obscure risks and vulnerabilities, leading to deficiencies in certain parts of the person's development. And finally, as Céline Cuvillé said a bit earlier, we should not forget that resilience is a tool particularly appreciated by unbalanced organization. It's a crutch on which to rest to the detriment of the resilient human being will eventually tire and destroy, destroy himself over time. Resilience is certainly a driving force, but it needs to be nurtured with kindness in particular. To enable human beings to emancipate themselves in, so in society, I often state the fact that for me, two stages will be the, the goals, completeness leading to plenitude. In this way, we'll be able to live in peace. So, yeah, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, ooh, that was loud. <laughs> uh, thank you for your, um, uh, I would say, explanation, but I think that's the wrong word in English. <laughs> Um, but uh, now we still have some time left for uh, a discussion between you guys. I wrote down some stuff, but of course I would like to look first to the public present here and also to the people at home. If they want to um, express some questions, they can. Uh, and I will take them on stage. So maybe it's a good idea to, to do that first, to actually see if here in the public, somebody has a question. Uh, there is a mic. Uh, so I don't know if somebody has an immediate urge to say something. Otherwise, we just start talking here. And if you hear something, you interfere. Wait, maybe take the mic. Otherwise, they don't hear you. Question for the both of you. Um, uh, you, in your, in your talk, uh, shared something uh, of the, I don't know the English word, um, the, the lady um, who, who was left alone, that she had um, like a reason and a, a purpose that the book was there and the work was there and she was in it. Um, and, and, and you had a, another reason or, or um, a starting point. Um, I think I heard something, but I'm curious with the both of you, if you could s say something about that uh, drive that starting point for yourself yeah. for me it's um, through um, I, I really love to tell stories when I found I am I'm curious about stories and I have spent a lot of time uh, reading um, I don't know the word in English fait divers um, somebody help again fait divers the funny um, newspaper, it's not criminal, it's not... Yeah, uh, like little stories you yeah. found, find everywhere. Like I'm totally fond of that. And uh, I would never do fiction because there's so many amazing stories in the world to tell. I I'm just love to try to find them and to tell them. And all of us, we are always uh, in, in contact with those stories, but we need to allow us the time to, um, to listen to them. And yeah, this is what I, I like to do. Um, yeah, I'm not always able to do it because when you are in your daily life and doing blah, 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 going 
there and there. You you don't listen to those stories. It can start with somebody saying something in in the in the metro or something. It can be a good story, but you have to have the time uh, to to uh, go deeper into those stories. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally fascinated about telling that kind of story. I don't know if I answer your question. To complete, also, I'm quite fascinated about the, the artistic process, also about the, the time of listening, but also the time to digest and the time to reflect, but also the time of maturity. Sometimes, uh, like you could have seen with the, the picture from Catherine's uh, art studio in which she, she uh, covers walls, um, I remember that I, I was really a huge fan when I saw that studio the first time because I also tend to cover my walls and I always thought like, you know, I look like this kind of serial killers from the movies, but actually I'm not the only one. Actually, most artists just, you know, you end up covering your, wall, uh, your, your walls. But what is interesting is just um, sometimes you have that urge to make something because you have that particular op opportunity and you need to do it right now. But sometimes we'll just you write it down and it will be on a post and then the post will end up on the wall and then the wall will just be, be covered from ceiling to the floor. And at the same time, this wall that you will just pass and pass every single day, maybe in 20 years actually, by just seeing that post again, you'll be like, fuck, this will be the one, this will be the next one and this has to be done now. And that long time process, I know that certain works, I'm... I, l I love them so much as an idea, but I feel that they are not mature enough to come out of the in the world. And sometimes the time of listening, it's also a time for listening also ourselves because we have that distance, as I was saying, to that we need to create with a particular topic or a particular subject in order to collect the information and then to make sure that we are ready to process it and then to produce it. Yeah, maybe um, I can quickly add into that um, because in both projects there was this um, different approach. Huh? You had a long-term project with the Caban um, and then you had your 10 weeks of uh, producing projects. Um, but um, in your residency, something you didn't mention is that you already had a pre-period where you did workshops, it was on your question because we don't, you know, it's not an obligation at Chaos. Um, could you elaborate why you wanted a period and how did it add or feed your uh, work? Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, but actually that's perfect because that connects the idea of what I was just saying now. It's It was now the time actually to to embrace that environment that I I didn't experience like this and I wanted to enter into that universe to be around people suffering from different uh, from different because I mean from the mental health uh, and different problems about it and I wanted to conduct this series of workshops in order to to produce content based on their own stories so Harvesting, collecting different stories, collecting different experiences, testing myself also into this, seeing how oh, actually I can adapt, adjust. And based on this, so I first had those, uh, a month and a half for almost two months of, of uh, weekly workshops uh, with the, the patients. And then after, right now at the moment, I have that residency that I'm going through. So, but this time it's really 24-7 really fully living and just sleeping, living there. And it's really great because it gives me different perspective, different angles, and also the luxury to have the time to um, live the experience also of others and try to be really as close as possible from this point of view in order to put me as the artist, more in the shadow, really in the background and just be there, observe, interact when it's uh, necessary, when it's uh, convenient, uh, when it's actually interesting, you know, when it's possible also. And and from that, let, let nobody be. 
Can you compare it a bit, Catherine, with, with what you uh, said, uh, for example, in the uh, work in the Caban? That at a certain point you said, okay, you know, I'm not always here and I miss things, so I give you the camera. So they also produce work and then your part as an artist is the editing, actually. Is that comparable with, with or is it a different um, approach? I had no um, consciousness of what I was exactly doing at that time. I was just uh, collecting material uh, with no specific strategy, except that I gave them uh, black and white cameras and I was photographing in color to make a some kind of contrast and also because they were only taking pictures at night. But um, actually I could have photographed for 20 years before doing the project, but um, well, Bleak died, and uh, also I've been, I was, um, I applied for a workshop in Japan, uh, and I was uh, selected, but twice, in, yeah, I was so afraid of not being selected one time, so, well, I, I wanted to work on another project, and then I, I have this workshop coming, and, but, well, I'm working for eight years in that uh, campsite now, so perhaps it's time to do something, so it was really not planned. At first I planned to make a project about the full campsite and then um, it, this was during the workshop that I realized it was Bleak and Nicole's story that was the best one, but it was totally unplanned. So I can't say that I was yeah, thinking about the strategy. It was yeah, just by chance. Yeah. Another thing that I hear a lot in, in the both of you, but in similar and different ways, is the concept of time. Um, I hear for you with the Caban, it's a very long period. But on the other hand, the other project was very short. It was like two meetings of a couple of hours. Yeah, it, it lasted for uh, three years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because after that, I go back and forth. Are, are you okay with uh, the, what I did? And yes, but you can change this and that. And then you send me the camera. And so the whole process lasted for three years. Okay. Yeah, that's something so different. I'm, then. I'm <laughs> a slow worker. <laughs> yeah. And for you also, it's like the limit of time of 10 weeks, now a month. Um, it, it, it seems a bit shorter and more intense, I think. Do you have these long-term time works? Or, for example, the time you are there now is very intense and you really cut off everything so you have that time? How, how important is time in your work? What, what, what's the surplus in this... Uh, in this kind of work you're making? People who see my agendas tend to fear. I mean, like, they really um, get uh, panic attacks when they see my fulfilled uh, three different kind of agendas. Because, indeed, I have the tendency to, to have quite uh, a huge discipline and dividing my days and my hours, really, and fill them as much as possible. So. I do go intentionally into this kind of a full uh, experience, but indeed in a shortened time. But at the same time, it's, um, I think just because I'm, you know, just being part of the usual work routine and just being influenced also by just the society and the place that I have because I have a, a working job and, and that of course has a, a deep influence because next to that I try to also have a, a family and social life and after that I try to also have my projects as a creator and as an artist. So, you know, it's like I'm different persons in the same day. And at the end of the day, I try to move forward with all these kind of different projects. So, of course, I have to make selections because I cannot do everything at once even though I wish I could. So, what I do is I try to work a bit every project but like you know like some kind of cook that i know that like the souffle will take a certain time the lasagna will take another amount of time and i hope by the end of the evening everything will be nicely on the table and nothing burnt i hope so especially not the house but yeah so what i do with projects it's also i giving myself the illusion of time and the illusion of short time because it's not totally true. For example, the, the experience I'm conducting right now with Chaos at the residency, it's 
brings me back to forcing myself to be alone that time that I never give, that I never have to be fully disconnected. Even for 24 hours, I, I never had this. So now I really try to, to go through this because especially um, I want to develop a, a certain research about resilience because of course it brings me back to uh, what I was saying before about my personal history. And, and of course I had a, a personal story also with psychological problems and of course that links me directly with the patients that I see every day and I want to, by understand them, I understand the world, I try to understand myself, which is most of the part of lots of artists. At first as an artist, I was always stating the fact that my projects is only, um, I, I work more like some kind of observer of the world and what I do is trying to depict the world I'm living in. And I remember that I was so angry when I saw a documentary about Joel Peter Witkin when he was saying something that every single work that you do is always a self-portrait. And I thought, fuck no. But actually, yeah, it's kind of, it's sometimes we're always kind of connected in a way or another way. It's the case with the, the story about eating and the eating process we're quite connected directly with that story. And I found that interesting how the artist is often linked in a way or another way about this particular topic. Sometimes you're the subject, sometimes just it's an ingredient in your in your pot. So yeah. Uh yeah, I was wondering if there are in the meantime other questions here in the room. Otherwise I will try to um look a little in my notes. Um ah, yeah. Uh there was this uh thought that came up, uh, but it was linked to uh, the work of Celine, um, where she worked with these female prisoners and where the place itself is a very important thing to have the work done, to be able to, to create certain work, but also to make connections with people. Um, yeah, at Chaos we are also in a very specific place. Uh, again, I come back to your Kaban. Uh, or Japan, for example, could be a place like that. Um, how uh, um, how do you um, somehow infiltrate that place in the work you do? Um, in the sense that uh, how yeah, I remember you said I was going to Japan for very specific reasons. Um, you are now at Chaos. Um, can you elaborate on the specific reason why it has to be in that place? Or is it just coincidence because you saw an open call and you thought, okay, that's... Um, well, it's a bit of both. I discovered chaos thanks to the open call that I saw, but at the same time, I actually, I was looking for that opportunity and this kind of experience that was in the back of my head for quite some time. The thing is that it is important for me to be present in the room in order to feel what is going on in the room, in order to really have a deep uh, knowledge of a particular topic, a particular notion, or an experience that people are going through. I want not to only do what I do most of the time, which is going to research, reading articles, informing myself, going to expos, and all kind of videos and, and stuff that I can listen, watch, learn, or what. At a certain time, I just also want to go on the field because being on the field, which gives me another angle, another approach, something that I cannot necessarily grab by just the sense of a, an article, a podcast, or a video. So, but also being present in the room forces me to be part of the room. And I would like to also observe myself how I react to that and what will change me about that. I mean, as an artist and with the artwork. So it has kind of a, a deep influence. So that's why for me, the, the, the biggest problem that I have, because I always try to be so organized every single time, everything is about organization and here, I try to actually arrive there to also make the space of 
not moving. The space of like the randomness. John Cage was often discussing about that, that you need to let things go. If there is a noise, the noise is part of the melody. So yeah, try to let the noise be heard and be part of the melody. I can imagine that's the best place to do that that uh, test, let's call it. Um, Put some noise there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And also to, to have to let go, I guess. Um, because, yeah, one of the things uh, we usually say when an artist starts at Chaos is, okay, at 9 o'clock and at 4 o'clock there's coffee. Go there, sit there, talk to people. Um, if I hear you talking, like, with this schedule and everything, that is a schedule, but there it stops. You don't know what happens. So how is that for you? <laughs> It's good because I'm I'm not totally actually out of my comfort zone because I've been in institutions, not in a psychiatric one, even though I uh, I just escaped three times from from it. But now it's in my own choice that I'm there, and it gives actually a stability to know that nine o'clock, four o'clock, there is the moment to have to be there to be present. And based on that, I construct my day. And I try to participate to the activities. I try to, to see the people, but also, I also try to be alone. And to have moments that I'm just on my own and moments I'm uh, with the people there. And, and yeah, it's, it comes quite natural. Yeah. And this is good actually to have also a discipline and organization, but in a more natural way based on the rules of others. And I just adapt myself with this. Do you think it's something that is possible outside of that context? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I see it's 9.30. So uh, we should wrap it up, as they say. Unless there is an urgent question from somebody. I would like to bring one more question. To ah, me. yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Because talking about time and space, I also like to, to ask her to talk more about the, the impact an artist can have on people and how it also lasts in time and the effect the artist can have on people or maybe even talk a bit. I already talked about that um, for Ernie and Plume, where uh, Nicole find um, her own yeah, um, the, the utility of, of the work to her. But yeah, I have kind of a, a lot of examples because I involve uh, a lot I in my project. Um, I've been working, for example, for uh, uh, about a project about the um, um, people who came very close to again at the lottery. The project is called Just My Luck. And well, to make the story short, it's a guy went to prison because he won the lottery because uh, he was uh, well, but we don't. Yeah, you can see the story here. Um, he went to prison because he won the lottery. He was accused of cheating, um, f having filled his own ticket after the draw. Well, blah blah blah. He went to prison and then he went out of prison and he tried to find new clues about uh, to, to, to prove his innocence and he did it for 30 years. He, uh, went se he tried seven times to reopen his case but the justice system didn't allow him to even if he had new proof every time. And then he received a letter saying uh, you are, uh, your, your file has been destroyed so it's not possible to be, um, to be innocent in as justice, and when I met him, he told me, "Now my only um, um, my only chance is to be symbolically innocent, uh, and my story should be told for that." And then we decided to make a project about his story and other stories. So the story is told, and it's not only this; it's like a um, effet um, boule de neige. I don't know. Snowball effect. Same. Okay. Snowball effect because uh, a journalist now uh, heard about the story because of our exhibition. He, he want to reopen uh, this this case, not in front of justice, but in symbolically reopen the case in in, in front of the public. So this has a real impact.
for that guy is yeah, kind of a, a relief after 30 years. And this is what also art can bring like very, um, very practical uh, point of view. Um, yeah, an another project I made is about ikikomoris. I don't know if you know about that. It's uh, people who are mostly young people um, after teenage. They are kind of working here. Um, they retire into their rooms uh, for sometimes uh, years, that sometimes for a lifetime too. It can happen, and uh, we made we made an, um, we enter into a dialogue together, and um, yeah, I really realized the responsibility I have as an artist because they were uh, some of them were uh, dependent on our relationship, and I'm not. Um, psychologist or, or psychiatrist and I was uh, confronted to that those people in great suffering and I was just talking with them saying I'm an artist and being very clear about my position but they were expecting things from me um, so I decided to uh, get in touch with a real um, psychiatrist to have some some keys and uh, we made an exhibition and I sent them uh, pictures about the exhibition I, I told them okay I got some messages on Instagram, people like your work and what you said and blah, blah. And I think this also have a real impact in real life for those people because it was a way for them to um, have a voice outside of their room. So yes, it can have uh, true uh, consequences in people's life. And we also should be very, um, um, take really good care about that when we work with people. That's very important to be respectful and try to understand um, everything that is around the situation and not uh, arm the people we, we're working with. I don't know if uh, it was the end of your question. <laughs> and maybe vice versa also, the rest of the world should be aware of the importance of art and artists, because uh, I also heard you're uh, dangerous as an artist. Well, I don't know if it's dangerous, but if I heard your list, I would never think of becoming an artist. <laughs> uh, luckily, there are enough people who do so uh, to keep some balance and to ask the right questions now and then. Um, so with this, uh, I would like to thank everybody here um, at Museum Dr. Gislain and at home watching. Um, of course, I want to thank the people from Museum Dr. Gislain again to host us once again in these really nice uh, surroundings where we can take some time to be. Um, so, yeah, we hope to see you next season. Uh, the dates are not set yet, but uh, you will surely hear about it on our website and socials. Um, and we do have a next activity. Uh, with Chaos, this time in XL, where we are, in Brussels. Uh, the 6th of July, we have something totally different. It's called Club Tropicana, which is a, a big party to start the summer with uh, yeah, activities for children. There's going to be performances, music performances. There's going to be bars, of course, food, etc. Majorette, I don't know the word in English. Um, so uh, everybody's welcome there. So do join in. It starts at 4 o'clock and we end around 9-ish. Um, and finally, of course, I would like to thank Stefan uh, and Catherine to join us on stage. Uh, and of course, Celine for the input she gave us. And um, also Diedrich, who's behind us and who did uh, the technique for the evening to make sure there were images and we, we were on live stream, etc. So thank you, everybody, and uh, see you hopefully next season. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for being there.